thank you very much, Mark, uh, for that. Um, I have to say it's a real honour to be invited to come and speak to you all. Um, I've already had a few people say how much they're looking forward to this. Um, thank you for raising the pressure. I appreciate that. Um, it's fantastic to be back here in, in, in Sydney. I started my professional career as a Java developer here, um, so it's really nice to come back and sort of see, see the city um, and meet some of the great minds here. Um, I'm also a sucker, a complete sucker, for test automation, scale, and um, performance testing. So I'm really pleased that there's loads of tracks on that coming up today. Um, if you are on Twitter, uh, I am SHS96C. It's an unusual username, never mind. Um, if you're on email, I'm SHS at Google. I will now try and make this work. There we go. Excellent. Um, so who am I? Well, I've already told you I'm SHS96C. Um, but what do I do? Why am I here? Well, other than the existential nature of the question, um, I'm actually a uh, software engineer in test at Google. I work in a group called Engineering Productivity, and the aim of what we do is to enable people to write software more effectively, more consistently, and more maintainably. Like, engineers given half a chance will treat software development as a sprint. They will go flat out, they will exhaust themselves, they will cut corners, they will hit their release date, and then they hit the next release, and they'll do the same again, and the next release, and they'll do the same again. Um, and after about a year of that, you've got a demoralized team and a code base that looks horrific. Um, have we all seen that sort of thing before? Maybe it's just European programmers that are doing that. Well done, you've got them all under control here. I'm very proud of you. Um, so yes, that's, that's who I am. Um, Software Engineers and Test, here to help. I'm also the lead of the Selenium project. So Selenium is a well-known browser automation framework. Um, we automate browsers to allow people to write automated tests. We tried to come up with a snappier way of describing it, but we failed miserably. Um, I've been leading that since uh, we merged the WebDriver project into it. So if you've been using Selenium, you may have seen Selenium 2 come out. Um, I was a project lead for that, and I was the creator of the WebDriver APIs. Um, so I work at Google on browser automation. So that includes Selenium, WebDriver, some of our grid offerings that we use internally, um, and things like that. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about our grid and how we actually have scaled our tests from um, where we were to where we are now. Um, I may even mention numbers, which we don't normally do. We're normally a bit cagey. We like to say things like, we've got more than one server in Google, and we run more than three tests a day, um, <clears throat> without necessarily being very clear about what those numbers actually are. Um, so yes. The most important thing that I'm going to be telling you is that although Google's environment is unique and different from almost everything else that I've seen out there, you can do a lot of what we do too. Um, we build a lot on open source software that is made readily available. In fact, we spend a lot of time and effort improving the quality of the open source software so that others can use it as well. Um, and there's a sort of three-step plan. You know when you sort of want to do something and they go, hey, it's really easy. And it's not really, but they tell you it's really easy. And they go, you know, first thing you want to do is you want to do this, and then you do this, and, and profit at the end. Well, uh, in order to scale your tests up to run the number of uh, instances that we do at Google, uh, you only need to do three things. The first one is to write some tests. That seems pretty easy. I hope we're all doing that here. Of all the conferences that I could <coughs> ask that question of, I hope this is the one where everyone goes, yes, we are writing tests. <laughs> um, second thing is to ensure test isolation. So it's not enough just to write tests. You need to be able to run them repeatedly, um, and you need to have them uh, be able to, to be in a position to run on a grid. And then once you've done that, once you've got those basic steps in the pla in, into place, head to the cloud. Hey, the cloud. That's a really trendy <laughs> phrase, isn't it? Who actually knows what the cloud is? I was really hoping someone could tell me. <laughs> that would make my life so much easier. Um, good. So no one knows what the cloud is. I am able to define it for us, um, which I'm now going to do a really sloppy job of. Um, 
As far as I'm concerned, the reason why we want to go to the cloud, we want to take advantage of all these sort of facilities, is to allow us to, to achieve scale. You know, if you wanted to, to not scale, you could just run things on your local machine and everything would be fine. But scale is what we can reach if we go to the cloud. And why the heck do we care about scale? I mean, you know, we're not one of these people who think that, you know, bigger is definitely better just because it is bigger, right? That's a senseless way of thinking. What a huge waste of time. And, and the engineering effort is phenomenal. So why do we care about it being bigger and scaling better? I come from the Agile community. Um, that's the sort of style of programming that I was brought up with, particularly XP. And the Agile community talk about tight feedback loops. You know, you want the moment from when that line of code is written to when you know that the application works to be as short as humanly possible. So you want to be able to, to get, tighten those feedback loops. Particularly with end-to-end -end testing, with web testing, um, those feedback loops can be pretty generous. I think is a diplomatic way of saying it. Um, <clears throat> you know, you frequently see test runs taking hours. That isn't conducive to being able to identify that the change you've written has just introduced a bug. So by heading to the cloud, hopefully, we'll be able to go faster, tighten the feedback loops, and provide people with the information they need in order to deliver quality software as quickly as possible. Because our job as testers isn't to find bugs. Our job as testers is to enable people to release a solid piece of work, uh, something that will delight customers and, and allow people to get on with the tasks that they're using your applications for. Who writes the tests at your company? Um, can I just do a quick straw poll and, and see what, what people do? Um, do the QA people, do the testers write the tests at your company? Okay, yeah, most people. Um, do the business analysts write tests at your company? Far smaller range of hands. What about software engineers? Do your, do your software developers? And do they write the end-to-end -end tests? Or do they just write unit tests? So end-to-end -end tests? Okay, that's unfortunate. Um, here's the thing, at Google, there are about seven software engineers to one software engineering test or test engineer. So we're outnumbered, hopelessly. And I don't think that ratio is uncommon in the industry. Like I think, you know, people have very large software development teams, and I think the QA team, the test team, is relatively small. Now, a developer can, line, can churn out 500 lines of code a day. Let's just call that as a random number. Um, if you've got seven times that, compared to one tester, one person doing all the testing, the testing's gonna fall hopelessly, hopelessly behind. And worse, the point of the tester isn't to test the code, it's there to help people release a solid product. Your software engineers, your software developers need to have some responsibility for writing the tests. Ideally, they should be able to write the unit tests, the integration tests, and they should be able to write the end-to-end -end tests. But there's some costs associated with this. I think that's self-evident, that you know, just the law of numbers says they need to do some of this. Um, I'm a big fan of TDD. So uh, there are two schools of test-driven development. Well, there's a, mi a million school of test-driven <coughs> development. There are about as many different schools of test TDD um, as there are people who practice it. But for the sake of argument, I'm gonna split it into two camps. There are the people who do the inside out TDD. So they write the smallest possible test that they can, and then they write the integration test, and then they write the large test, and then they realize that they have completely got the idea wrong, uh, and they haven't actually written the feature that they thought they were writing. But they've had a whale of a time doing it. And then there's inside out TDD, where you start with the end-to-end -end test. And that provides you scaffolding, and that one end-to-end -end test that you're attempting to write forces you to write those integration tests, and then they lead down to, to unit tests. So I really like that, that school of TDD. And I want my developers to do this. Now, I don't know, developers, they're a, they're a beardy bunch, aren't they? Um, they can be somewhat stuck in their ways. They, they really like ASCII. Uh, let's take a look. C Sharp. Well, it's UTF-8. Let's call it ASCII. I haven't seen very many, very many international characters other than maybe accents. Um, 
Python, Ruby, JavaScript, Java. They're all text-based. Worse, developers are married to their IDE of choice, or Vi, or Emacs. We'll have a debate later about which one of those is better. Um, so they love their text editors, and their IDEs are designed entirely for throwing around text. That means that whatever you pick for your testing infrastructure needs to marry well with that if you want your testers to do it. This is unfortunate. Many of the commercial products out there have a prohibitively high price tag. So you end up having to sort of have guardians of the test tools who, who are the ones that have the floating license and so they can run the tests. So you can't do TDD because, well, first of all, you can't use the tool. If you could use the tool, they store it in some binary format. Developers love abstractions. They love throwing code around. They love this stuff. So whatever test tool we use that we put in front of people, we encourage them to pick a test tool that saves text, plain text, that can be pushed into source control and can be rerun. So what did we do at Google? Back in the dim and distant mist of time, there was manual testing. Yes, I can see how excited you all are about that. Um, we got past that pretty quick. Um, and we started using Selenium. Um, how, many, how many here have heard of Selenium, other than just now when I started? That's very reassuring, thank you. Um, brilliant. Um, and Selenium was, was kind of fun. It was kind of cool. It allowed you to, if you remember, to start the server up. Um, this was many years ago with Selenium 1. Um, it, you know, you could run the tests in a local machine and you could see the browser going flick, 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 flick through your application. Um, and the developer machines are, are fairly pokey. Yeah, they've got, you know, grunty CPUs, they've got big disks, they've got oodles of RAM. I mean, they may have had as many as 512 megahertz processors. And they may have had as much as 64 megabytes of RAM. Um, you know, these were impressive machines back in the day. I'm joking for comic effect, obviously. Um, but one of the points here is that uh, that environment isn't particularly useful or conducive if you run into a problem. You run the tests, you've got Firefox 2.01 installed on your machine, tests fail, you go, Dave, take a look at this, can you run that test? He checks it out, runs it. He's got a snapshot of Firefox 3 um, and a test pass for him. So you end up with that sort of terrible world of it works properly on my machine. Um, how are we doing for time, by the way? I can't see a clock. Never mind. I've spoiled, I've, I've broken the, the illusion of, of, of careful flow, haven't I? Never mind. Um, so yes, it works on my machine. Uh, OK, fine. Well, maybe we can get around this by having like one machine where we run our tests. That, probably that'll be OK. If it passes on that, then we'll say it passes. And if it fails on your local machine but passes on that, will say it passes. Um, the other thing as well is you're limited by the browsers that you've got available on your local machine. At, at Google, we do a lot of our work on, on Linux desktops. We are probably the only place where Linux is actually on the desktop. Um, and it's great. It's fantastic. But it does mean um, that testing with Internet Explorer is quite tricky. And when I say quite tricky, I mean Microsoft haven't released i.e. 10 for Linux, for Linux yet, um, so we can't do it very easily. That's unfortunate because the majority of our users are out there on the internet using some variant of IE. Um, IE, uh, IE 6 is, is still out there, um, and you know, we've got IE 10 on the horizon. Uh, it, it accounts for a very, very large percentage of the market. Um, <clears throat> even if we you know, do have the browser, maybe there are platform inconsistencies, so maybe sort of the browser Firefox works one way on Linux and works in a different way on Windows. But hey, we can run the tests, we can see them going, we can debug them. There's got to be something better than this. So here's an interesting thing. Your end-to-end -end tests take, let's just pluck a number out of the air, three minutes to run. And that's fine when you've got one test. And that's fine when you've got two tests. It starts to get tedious at three. By the time you hit 150, 
you might as well just start running the test and go home because that's the rest of your working day sorted out for you. Um, if you run them in serial. But what you could do is you could run them in parallel. If you ran all your tests at the same time, then the test run would take only as long as the longest test would take to pass or fail. Actually, no, my developers fail. So you want to be able to, to run your tests in parallel. Now, we've said already that the original Selenium solution was running on people's individual desktops. And although those are comparatively powerful machines, they can't run 150 tests in parallel. I mean, have you even tried, you know, we've got modern laptops now. Who here uses like Firefox or Chrome or IE with, with tabs? Like, by the time you've got about 50 tabs open, if you ever get that far, your machine is sort of sitting there refusing to talk to you and sulking like a teenager. It's just not good. So we need some, some mechanism to be able to, to spread out these tests. Now, the techniques that we use for allowing us to run the tests in, 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 in parallel are things like test isolation. Test isolation is really important. You need to be able to take a test and run it in any order because guess what? it might be running in any order. You know, you're going to be sharding this over a series of different machines. So when a test suite runs in your local machine, maybe you accidentally break test isolation by modifying some data. And so when the tests are run in order, they pass. And when you run one, it fails. I'm seeing nods from the audience. I think we've all seen this in our own test suites. Um, you know, even when, when someone introduces a new test, then that accidentally changes the ordering. Um, there are things you can do to reduce the, the sort of pain of this even before you start scaling out. And the first thing to do is to randomize the order of your test suites. Hey, that sounds pretty advanced. Um, it's not, it's really easy. Uh, sadly, uh, I used a lot of JUnit. Um, there isn't a randomizing test runner in that yet, but it's not hard to write. You just, you know, it's, it's 30 lines of code. Ooh, brilliant. So you've randomized the order of the tests and you run them. Um, and then you run into the second problem. And the second problem is that uh, you've only, you're only using one user account. Uh, and you've got uh, your test carefully setting up and tearing down data. And so midway through a test, suddenly all the test data that this one was expecting is cleared by this test here. That's suboptimal. Um, one way to do that is to just have as many different user accounts as, as there are um, tests running in, in the example of a user account being the constrained resource. And that's fine if you can create these things indefinitely. Um, but there are cases like databases are, are a classic example where um, you can't just create more of these resources. You're going to have to use what you've got. The traditional way of solving this problem is probably the right way. And that's to lock the resource if you're using it. So say you've got you know, five of a particularly expensive message queue um, that you can use for testing, and you can't create more. So you start up all your tests, the first test goes, give me one, give me one, give me one, give me one. First five tests get something, the sixth test goes, give me a queue, and uh, the test then blocks until a queue becomes available. So you wanna lock access to, to these resources. The other thing that you're gonna have to be very, very careful of is, um, I don't know about you, but like I see people write tests like, make sure there are no messages in the mailbox, send a message, make sure there is one message in the mailbox. <clears throat> and when you're running a, your own test, actually that's a really reasonable thing to say. But when you're running multiple tests and maybe you're sharing resources, that's a terrible test to write. Like, in the course of you doing that, someone may have created three mail messages, someone deleted four, you end up with minus one message in the message boxes. It's terribly confusing. Um, test the delta. Test the change that you expect to see, not the raw numbers. So don't go, make sure there's only one mail in the message box. Say, I expect there to be one mail, and I expect it to look like this. And then you can drop the, I expect there to be one mail, you can say, I expect this message to appear once in the message box. And that's a far more robust test. And that allows you to survive sort of taking your initial test suite, running it on your local machine, and starting to become, uh, to running these, in, these things in parallel. Um, that snail's probably got the right idea when it all gets a bit too much. 
call it a day, go for a coffee. And when I say coffee, I mean glass of wine. So we've managed to solve many of the problems of isolation. Um, that's kind of fun. The next thing that we did at Google is we set up the Selenium farm. Um, this uh, was spoken about by Jennifer Bevan at the London Test Automation uh, Conference. And a chap from ThoughtWorks called Philip Herringu went off and, and wrote Selenium Grid. And this allows you to set up a central node with some slave nodes. And you communicate with that central node, and that passes out sort of the test runs to, to various machines. And that allows you to solve that problem that we had. You can only test on the browsers you have available to you. So now you just set up a slave node with, with Windows, and suddenly the chap running on Linux can start running the IE tests. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Um, better still, you've just got this sort of pool of machines. So you can start running more tests in parallel. Like it's easy to get 20 desktops and start running various bits and pieces on them. Each desktop can run four or five Firefox instances. Suddenly you've gone from being able to run four or five Firefox tests in parallel to 20 times that number. You can get through your test suite a heck of a lot faster. That's kind of cool. But it comes with problems. Um, <clears throat> the first problem is, who the heck manages this pool of machines? I'll give you a hint. Your testers don't want to do it. I'll give you another hint. Your software engineers don't want to do it. And I'll give you a third hint. Probably, unless they're very forgiving, your IT uh, group don't want to be managing this lump of machines. I mean, you know, this pool of machines is a constant maintenance nightmare. You've got multiple different operating systems at different patch levels that need to be updated. Um, maybe, you know, you want to test with Windows XP and Windows 7 and Windows Vista. But XP differs between Service Pack 1, 2, and 3. Um, and some of your users are running Mac OS, so you've got some Mac minis tucked away in there. Um, and then your developers really like their Linux, so you've got some Linux nodes, but they're running one of the 89,000 different Linux distributions there are out there. I think that may be an underestimate. <coughs> you know, and there are tools out there to help you reduce that number. Um, you know, you can use Puppet or Chef to try and do automated inst installations of things. Um, Microsoft provides some really good tools for managing desktops and allowing you to push out updates and things like that. Um, but you've still got that sort of cost of maintaining that grid of, of physical machines somewhere. Um, there was one memorable moment at work, which I shouldn't tell you about, but I'm going to anyway, where um, the initial Selenium farm that we had uh, was basically running in a room somewhere on campus. And uh, a, a, one of the cleaners came in, looked at the room, went, gosh, this is dirty, unplugged a power plug so she could plug in the Hoover uh, and took out half the farm. It was both hilarious, confounding, and an important lesson learned. <clears throat> so the farm is, is there. But let's imagine you've got that management issue sorted out. There are other problems. It's a shared resource. And developers are evil-minded little so-and-sos. And even if they don't mean to, they'll occasionally lock the, uh, the, th the, the, the service. You know, now that they've, they've got the ability to run more than five tests at the same time, you'll find someone trying to run 1,000 at the same time. Um, and that's unfortunate because you've only got capacity for 500 tests. That's okay, you can key these things up. And, but you end up putting a huge amount of load on, uh, on the machines. You start running into weird threading issues. Um, <clears throat> and worse, you end up in situations where people accidentally uh, DOS the machine, denial of service the machine. Um, for example, you know, a modal dialog box comes up and the test freezes. And then that node never really recovers. Um, and, and what are you going to do about that? Well, there are some things you can do to, to solve that problem. Um, the first thing is, like, why are we managing physical machines? Like, that seems a daft way of doing things. Let's at least put things onto a virtual machine. And then maintenance becomes, we'll update the virtual machine image, we'll copy it out, and then we can run the same virtual machine image everywhere. And we know that we've got consistent hardware, we've got consistent versions of things, um, and the maintenance of it becomes easier. The other nice thing with a virtual machine is that you can uh, reboot it from a snapshot. 
so you can bring it up in a known working state. That's kind of fun. That's kind of cool. Um, and then the other thing as well is that it becomes really cheap to throw these virtual machines away and reuse them. Now, how often do you do this? Like for a while at Google, we were going, well, on average, we can get about 20 test runs. At, like, I'm just making this number up, but we can get 20 test runs out of a machine um, before the chances of it locking up are pretty high. So uh, every, uh, after every 20 test runs, we'll just reboot the virtual machine. Um, you can also make better utilization of hardware that way, by the way. Sort of nowadays, modern computers, even this laptop has got like multiple cores in it. Um, you know, the, the machines that you fit into the racks now are hugely, hugely powerful. And if you're using them to run five browsers, you're not really using them very hard. Um, the one lesson I would give uh, from my development experience is that each virtual machine needs its own spindle. So uh, one disk per VM is a really nice way of keeping the speed up. And you need masses and masses of memory, and licenses may start to become a problem. <clears throat> but what happens if you start taking this and, 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 and sort of dialing up to 11? Google has a massive build grid that we use to, to build our software. Um, you know, why, why do we have a separately managed environment when we could just run on the build grid that we've got available to us? OK. And we've got virtual machines now. so. What we need is a mechanism for starting up virtual machines on a random box. That's kind of fun. Um, and why do we wait for 20 tests? Why not just start up a new virtual machine every time someone says, I need a new browser? You're guaranteed to be in a known state if you do that. And people go, but that's you know, really slow. It takes about 30 seconds to boot a virtual machine from a snapshot. Um, it takes about that amount of time to cold start uh, an instance of uh, some of the older browsers. Modern browsers will start up in a fraction of that, but 30 seconds isn't much of an over overhead. It's kind of, that's, that's a reasonable price to pay, and you get consistency. So what we do is we run virtual machines on our build grid um, that are started on demand, um, and they're available uh, whenever we need them. 10 minutes, brilliant, thank you. I've got light shining in my eye, but now I've got, I know how much time I've got. This is brilliant. Um, yeah, so, I mean, but you probably don't have uh, a build grid like Google's. Um, <clears throat> and you probably don't have engineers dedicated to improving the state of browser automation at your company. Um, do any of you actually have that? Love to have a chat with you. Okay, that's fine. Um, for, for those of you who, who are watching, um, that was absolutely no one put the hands up. Uh, it's fortunate <clears throat> that the tools you need to do this are now available as open source. We've already talked about like, how, the, how the tools you need for writing the test should, should be something that merges with the developer's workflow. So Selenium WebDriver, I'm going to talk about Selenium because I'm a sucker for it and, and I work on the project, so I'm allowed to. Um, Selenium WebDriver provides a series of APIs in most of the major languages to enable you to articulate tests in a, in a programming language. If you're a Ruby fan, um, there's another framework called Water that's available. Um, you know, JavaScript has its own testing frameworks and stuff like that as well. There's loads of these things. Um, but you can enable your developers to write using something like Selenium WebDriver. Your next question is, well, how do I actually start running these grids that sound so tempting and interesting. Um, I'd probably start with what we did at Google and have a farm. Like finding space for 20 machines is probably easier than solving the problem of how do I have a build grid of nearly infinite size that I can run these things on. But 20 machines you, can, you could probably find space for, right? And when you do that, um, take a look at Selenium Grid. Um, Selenium Grid Version 2 supports a new WebDriver APIs. Um, it's pretty slick. Uh, and it was donated, uh, it was primarily developed by a, an engineer at eBay uh, called Francois, uh, Francois Reynard. Uh, we appear to have French people write grid implementations on the Selenium project. Uh, Philippe Heringo was also French, uh, who wrote the original one. <clears throat> now, out of the box, Selenium grid can be run in the farm configuration. 
Uh, you bring up a node on the individual instances, and, and that's kind of fun. Um, but it's got provision in it. We haven't supplied the software because there are so many different ways of doing it, but it's got provision in it for starting up a VM on demand as well and shutting down that VM. So the hooks are there for you to do some really interesting things with just a little bit of engineering effort. And virtual machines nowadays used to be an exotic thing. Um, does anyone remember when VMware came out for the first time? Yeah, I remember that. And it was so exciting to be able to run a virtual machine at something crashingly slow on your local machine, and it was fantastic. Um, nowadays, virtualization layers are being built into operating systems. Windows has, has hypervisors. Um, they're the KVM, the kernel virtual module extensions, uh, available for Linux. And that allows you to use products like uh, um, QMU, I think, is one of them. Box is another. Um, you know, VMware itself. On the Mac, if you've got Mac hardware, uh, OS X Lion that, that, that's available explicitly allows you to virtualize Lion on Lion. So you can now run virtual instances of, of OS X on, on Apple branded hardware with Apple software. Um, and you know, you've got Fusion there and you've got um, some of the other tools. Uh, uh, Parallels is the, is the other major virtual machine framework. So you've got all the pieces now. Um, you know, there's a tool called Vagrant, which will provision VMs, uh, Linux VMs on demand, and allow you to use Chef or Puppet to configure them. I mean, that's really cool. So you've got the ability to set up these virtual machines pretty easily. Um, and we're living sort of in the, in the second decade of the 21st century. Disk space is cheap. I remember when someone went, that's a lot of data that we need to convert. And uh, my colleague said to them, how, how much is a lot? And he went, it's a lot. He went, how much is a lot? And that chat went, 30 gigabytes. My friend looked at him and went, what, one iPod? Disk space is cheap now. And these virtual machine images, you know, although they're two or three gigs, are only two or three gigs. Like, we're living in the future. We might as well enjoy it. But you may not have a grid of infinite size, or you may not have the ability to, um, to set up these 20 machines. Like, what else can you do? Well, fortunately, Amazon, um, with their Elastic Compute Cloud, have um, set up the ability to allow you to, to sort of spin up virtual machines in their cloud. So you could use that. But the Amazon in instances take you know, minutes to start up. And you know, if your promise is that you're going to crash, uh, 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 crash um, the times taken for, for your automated tests, if you're going to reduce them dramatically, a five minute addition to each test run isn't really acceptable. But there are commercial pro providers out there um, who will be able to offer you a virtual machine on the go. Um, Source Labs is one of them. I mean, you introduce some additional latency because what used to run in your local machine then used to run on your LAN, now has two internets in the way. But they're working on resolving that issue. And again, you get the machines for free, someone else is doing all the maintenance work. Um, you get a pretty cruisy existence out of it. Um, if you can head to the cloud and get someone else to manage that stuff for you, you can, you can achieve that, that scale that we've been looking for. So to recap, first thing to do, write some tests. I like to use Selenium WebDriver, but I would say that. Second thing to do, um, ensure test isolation. Like, now you've got the tests written, you need to be able to start running them in parallel before you can start taking advantage of the capabilities and the interesting things you can do on the build grids. So randomized test ordering, that will identify some issues. Lock shared resources, e.g. things like um, accounts or, or stuff like that. And rather than testing for an explicit number, Test the change that you expect to see in the system while you're writing the test. Like, that's the really hard thing to get through people's minds, because they run it on their local machine. They go, well, there's only one. You go, yes, but on your machine, there's one. But when you run it with everyone else's test, there are 50. And then you're in a position to head to the cloud. So you've now got yourself sorted out. You can start running Selenium Grid uh, on your local network. And that allows you to have this sort of centrally managed resource. That's really good if you're worried about privacy, by the way. If you don't want anyone seeing your super secret banking app, then that works. Um, <clears throat> consider using virtual machines. That allows you to make better utilization of the hardware that you've got available to you. And when the local grid isn't enough, when that management of it becomes too much, 
then feel free to head out to the commercial cloud providers. EC2, Amazon, uh, Source Labs are there, uh, BrowserMob, they'll also be able to help you. Um, there are all these different companies. And then hook it into continuous integration. Like the reason why we started on this journey was to provide really fast feedback to our developers. We've got automated tests, we've got the ability to run them in a reasonable amount of time. We might as well run them continuously and do continuous integration, provide that feedback, tighten those feedback loops, and really deliver good, high quality, solid software that will delight our customers. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>